would anyone even care if something bad happened to me? According to Harvard Medical School, a severe and persistent low mood, profound sadness, or a sense of despair is the most prevalent symptom for those with major depression. And depression is on the rise for millennials, diagnoses rising by 47% since 2013. A YouGov survey described millennials as the loneliest generation, with 30% of millennials saying they often or always felt lonely, as opposed to 20% of Gen X and 15% of boomers. So why am I starting a video about a half hour sitcom with these statistics? Following its premiere on TBS in 2016, Search Party was quickly labeled by critics as a scathing satire of millennials and their tendencies towards narcissism, deep insecurity, and treating social media activism as a genuine replacement for meaningful political action. And it's not that I disagree with any of these observations. Search Party absolutely is satire. The use of humor, irony, exaggeration, or ridicule to expose and criticize people's stupidity or vices particularly in the context of contemporary politics and other topical issues. Search Party fits the definition perfectly. The series is an expert blend of humor, irony, and exaggeration used to critique millennials and the modern world they navigate. Right now I'm working for a major artist. I'm producing her show. I can't really say who she is, but I'm she's huge. Um, I'm a stylist, I'm a designer. I can act if I need to. I could curate. I really just like projects. I should introduce you to Martine. Oh, I love Martine. <laughs> She's amazing, so no introduction needed. But there's more to it than simply exposing the narcissistic tendencies of an entire generation. I also don't think there's anything particularly unique about millennials and narcissism. I just think it's revealed itself in different ways than previous generations did. The series is just as, if not more, interested in the why as it is in the what. Why are millennials facing higher rates of mental illness, loneliness, and deaths of despair? Where does this undercurrent of dissatisfaction come from, and how does it surface? It's just like, everybody can tell me what I can't do. But nobody can tell me what I can do. Let's back up. Search Party, created by Sarah Violet Bliss, Charles Rogers, and Michael Showalter, follows 20-something Dory Seif, played by Alia Shawcott, who, in an attempt to create some sort of meaning in her life, becomes an amateur sleuth and spearheads an investigation into the recent disappearance of a casual acquaintance, if even that, from college, named Chantal Witherbottom. Dory recruits her boyfriend Drew and their two friends Elliot and Portia to help her look for clues into Chantal's disappearance. Search Party is the definition of underrated. Prior to its move to HBO Max for its third season, the show averaged around 500,000 viewers for any given episode. This video is spoiler free because you really should go into the show somewhat blind, but the first season sees them falling further and further down a rabbit hole of conspiracies and shady figures and culty dinner parties and questionable real estate dealings. I'm a head realtor at T.W. Brownway. I don't know how acquainted you are with the uh, company, but it's pretty high end. Search Party is simultaneously thrilling and hysterical, walking a nanometer wide tightrope between dark psychological mystery and farcical comedy, while also elevating above those genres into a realm I haven't seen a series do quite so expertly. Our hero, Dory, is in a weird limbo state those in their mid-twenties often find themselves in, feeling a vague dissatisfaction that's permeating all aspects of her life. She works an unfulfilling and menial job as a lonely rich lady's assistant. Dory, how is it that you are so good at all the stuff no one else wants to do? Her boyfriend, Drew, is this tall, lanky man-child who's kind of an embodiment of her apathy. Their sex, if you can even call it that, is just so deeply uncomfortable to watch. Oh, you ready? Yeah. In the first scene, he tells her that he needs more ketchup, like a toddler. This is not enough ketchup. I'm gonna need some more ketchup, sweetie. And he drags his feet on doing anything when they hear an escalating domestic violence situation in the apartment downstairs. This. If we hear like a glass shatter or something like that, I'll go over there. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Oh my God. Uh, yeah, I don't. I, that could have been anything. I don't know. They both care for the other, but it's clear that, at this point, they're only together out of convenience than any real desire or attraction. When Dory becomes interested in Chantal's disappearance, Drew doesn't take it seriously. 
or at least not in any non-superficial way. He doesn't find it strange that she's taken such a strong interest in the disappearance of someone who is essentially some random stranger. I mean, for real, and I feel bad saying this, especially here, but like, I don't remember her at all. In fact, his attitude towards Chantal's disappearance resembles a TV sitcom husband who's being dragged by the wife to go shopping or their kid's shitty flute recital. Dory, I think we should go. I feel like people are looking at us. What am I supposed to do? I mean, it's not like I came all the way out here for nothing. Dory, I'm so sorry. Julian was asking to do like a profile piece on me, like the whole water bottle adventure, and I'm just wondering if like, is that weird? Elliot is just as aimless in his life as Dory and Drew, but has built a facade around his insecurities and initially comes across as the embodiment of the fierce white gay stereotype who has a witty response to everything. He's working on a philanthropic project involving chic designer water bottles. We're making these designer water bottles, and for everyone that we sell in the States, we're actually going to give one to one of the African villages in need. So. so, I'm sorry, but obviously the problem in Africa is not that they don't have water bottles. It's like that they don't have water. Believe me, I know, and we will also always set aside a percentage of our proceeds, and some of that we're going to share with the villages, Leslie, so. So, like a percentage of the percentage? and somewhat constantly talks about his battle with cancer back when he was a teenager. But when I was in high school, I was diagnosed with stage four lymphoma. You know about my history with cancer, right? And it was frightening and it was disturbing and it was beautiful. And I learned to take friendship very seriously, okay? Because the greatest lesson I learned in that entire time is that you can't fight a war alone. He has no idea who Chantal is, but upon learning of her disappearance, immediately runs to Twitter to share his deepest sympathies. Elliot's narcissism is on full display in a much more explicit fashion than our other lead characters, but it's a faux narcissism. He's pretending to have unlimited confidence and be above everyone else as a way of hiding his deep feelings of inferiority and fear that he is inherently unlovable. Even as he continuously fails upwards throughout the season, his need to be needed grows and grows to be eventually untenable. Finally, Portia rounds out the group as the somewhat clueless but lovable friend. Her relationship with her emotionally distant mother has triggered a deep need to please in Portia. I'm like so embarrassed that you can't stop telling people. Congratulating you for what? Surviving Essex. What? It's the show that I had. Got the audition and I got. Funny enough, she's actually the only one in the group who's making legitimate moves in her career as an actress. She's cast in a shitty crime procedural as a Latina cop because... I'm ethnically ambiguous. While Portia fulfills the dumb blonde role, it never feels like the show is punching down or making her unsympathetic. She has a surprising depth and magnanimity due in large part to Meredith Hagner's performance infusing Portia with an inherent likability the character would otherwise lack. All right, uh, I get advised by a lot of people, not my close friends, that I should sort of be um, less girly and kind of more professional. And I just, I don't know if it's wrong to think this, I just think that you don't have to be one kind of woman and I think that like I should be able to get my nails painted and also be smart and a lot of people don't really think I'm that smart and I think that's frustrating because I think I'm my own kind of smart. Um, and I know you're probably all thinking like this girl's really conceited. But we're sharing so I thought I would just share. It makes sense, given Dory's current status aimlessly floating in a void of dissatisfaction, that when she sees that a girl she sort of knew in college has gone missing, she latches onto it, feeling that this could be the purpose she's been craving. But it isn't. Her projection of herself onto Chantal, looking for Chantal with the same tenacity she hopes others would have for her if she went missing, is simply that. Projection. After living through two major recessions, seemingly endless military conflicts, a global pandemic, and skyrocketing student debt, to name a few, people Dory's age have an ingrained feeling of volatility, that what you have today, either materially or otherwise, may vanish tomorrow. It's difficult to have confidence in a future that may not exist, and building your identity knowing who you are 
is nearly impossible when the world around you is shifting at an exponential rate. The characters of Search Party are, whether they know it or not, attempting to assert their worth and value in an uncaring and apathetic environment. It makes sense that these four would be identified correctly as egocentric assholes by TV critics. The greater one feels left behind, the greater their attempt will be to stand in the center of a room and yell, I matter. And the only thing I could think to do Alex! is take the is put Alex! one, just one second. Okay. I'm just gonna Shh. wrap that up. I'll finish it. Wrap it up. I'll tell you later. Search Party is a fascinating and hilarious exploration of individualism and the existential dread one feels when you realize that you're ultimately just not that big of a deal. That any attempt to satiate your need to be needed is futile. And even when you do gain any notoriety or fame, it does nothing to actually give you any sense of purpose. And if you weave a fantasy narrative where you are the hero and the only one who can save the day, don't be surprised when it all unravels, leaving you to face reality.